The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. There is much that remains unknown about humans of the Paleolithic era, but tonight on this International Women's Day, we'll learn why archaeologists say there is much to correct in the record about the lives of prehistoric women. Also, we'll revisit a conversation about whether COVID-19 vaccines altered women's menstrual cycles. First up, Nam Kiwanuka talks to writer Heather Marshall about her debut historical novel that traces a seminal shift in Canadian women's reproductive rights. It's Tuesday, March the 8th, and that's next on The Agenda. Most Canadian women probably cannot imagine how different their lives might have been if they had been born just 30 or 40 years earlier, especially when it comes to their reproductive rights. A new novel brings that story to life. It's called Looking for Jane. The sweeping historical narrative is the debut work by Heather Marshall, and she joins us now. Hi, Heather. Hello, Nan. How are you? Great book. Um, terrific. I don't want to spoil anything about this book. I think it's one of those books that you need to read yourself. So in our conversation, we'll kind of try to steer away from the details. Uh, but just to okay. get us started, I wanted to read a little excerpt from your book. If any of my friends ever need this, can I tell them to call you? Can I give them your name then? Dr. Taylor shakes her head. No, but you can give them this number to call. She reaches into the pocket of her scrubs and pulls out a small white card, hands it to Nancy. Nancy turns it over in her hand. There's nothing on it but a handwritten phone number. Whose number is this, she asks. Three quick honks blare from outside, and Nancy nearly jumps out of her skin. Dr. Taylor reaches behind Nancy's back to turn the creaky brass handle, opening the door onto a blast of cold evening air. Just tell them to ask for Jane. So, without giving away too much of the plot, can you tell us broadly what Looking for Jane is about? Yeah, so it follows the lives of three women of three different generations, all living in Toronto. And it's about uh, family secrets, uh, a lost letter, and women's um, ability to dictate their own lives. What inspired the book title, Looking for Jane? Oh, so I'm actually glad you asked that. Um, so I guess to, to begin, there's sort of, um, there's two types of writers. One is plotters who plan everything from the very beginning and then write the book. And the other is what we call pantsers, which is people who just fly by the seat of their pants. And I am definitely a pantser, but <laughs> I usually know sort of the, the last scene or sentence or chapter of a book. It's usually what comes to me first and what I write first. And then I sort of work my way back from that. And when I conceptualized looking for Jane, the last scene, and I won't, I won't give anything away, but that last line and the last scene came to me very, very clearly. And I thought, okay, I know, I know the title. The title is Looking for Jane. And uh, again, without giving too much away, um, each of the three main characters are in some way or another looking for Jane. So it, it came together quite beautifully, I think. I'm gonna have to uh, steal Panzer <laughs> from now on. <laughs> it's a thing in the writing community and we're all like slightly ashamed. We wish we were plotters, but... Uh... It's not always the way. The creative process has a mind of its own. Well, you mentioned that the story uh, revolves around three women in three different generations. Why did you to, why did you decide to write it that way? I think for me, as a I mean, as a consumer, as a reader, I really enjoy uh, multiple perspectives on the story. And as a writer, I always think that there's you know always more than one side to every story. And so that kind of format, allows me to explore that same story from different angles. So I think it does in some ways just give a, a more fulsome picture of what's going on, but it also allows me to have a bit of fun with it in a way you can use different literary devices, different voice. So from a creative perspective, I get to sort of write, you know, three different books within one book or three different stories within one book. Um, so yeah, from a creative perspective, I really enjoy that. But for this book, particularly, um, 
as I say, it's kind of my my preferred format. But when I set out to do it, uh, I don't think I realized quite how ambitious it was until I was into the weeds on it. But I wanted to show kind of this this sweeping history of women's reproductive choice in Canada throughout the decades. So historical fiction was sort of the the right uh, genre for that, but also this format um, that allowed me to show different perspectives of those women living through those years where things were very different from one year to the next or one decade to the next. You say that historical fiction was the right genre to tell this story. Why is that? I mean, quite naturally, you know, it was um, the maternity home system was in operation through the 1940s to through to the 70s. So that in itself is, you know, his, historical fiction. And then everything even from the 80s to present day was more kind of the, the near past. And again, because I sort of wanted to really show the evolution and how far we've come and how far we still have to go in some ways. Historical fiction was just the the right method for that. I want to come back to the maternity home system in a little bit. Um, Mm -hmm. But in your author's notes, you write that your first inclination is to say that this book is, um, it's a book about abortion, but that it isn't. What did you mean by that? Yeah, so it was always, um, you know, there's this this thread of the novel that's about women's fight for reproductive choice in Canada throughout the decades. But then there's this other thread that's all about the maternity homes and what connects them is motherhood as a theme. So I do think that this novel is about motherhood. It's about the lengths women will go to end a pregnancy or to become pregnant and then all of that gray area in between. And, um, you know, I hope that's I hope that's what I've explored here. But I I would say it is about motherhood and many facets of it. When women reach a certain age, there is still this is something all women want. You write that looking for Jane is about motherhood, uh, about wanting to be a mother and not wanting to be a mother and all the gray areas in between. Why did you want to confront that stigma about motherhood? I mean, it's um. You know, we might get this to, to this a little bit later, but my my personal brand of feminism is all about choice. And so I think it's important that we acknowledge women's different choices when it comes to motherhood. There's often an element even of it being some kind of a race. You know, if you don't have children by a certain age, um, that there's something sort of wrong with you or you've made a mistake or you failed in some way. And... I really wanted to emphasize that people's choices, their individual choices are valid if that's what's right for them. Um, Parenthood is not for everyone. I'm a parent now and I can totally understand why some people might not want to do this. It's that's a lot of work and you have to be very passionate about it, I think. So, um, you know, the assumption that all women want to be mothers and if they don't, that there's something wrong with them is a stigma that I can't believe is still sticking around. So it's it's one of the elements that I really wanted to explore in this book. Uh, and the book has a lot of uh, historical facts weaved through this story that you tell. Um, through the course of your, your research, was there anything that you found out that kind of shocked you? Oh, I think, um, you know, the history of abortion access and women accessing illegal and terribly unsafe abortions was unfortunately not shocking to me. Um, But I think the, the biggest shock was the research on the maternity home system. And that was, I think, some of the most emotional research I've ever had to do um, in studying history. And I had to sort of step away from it sometimes, take a bit of a break from it. I I'd known about maternity homes just kind of in the ether, but never really gave it much consideration, what they were, what they meant, or that there were real women and girls um, that were deeply traumatized by them. We've mentioned the maternity home system uh, a couple Mm -hmm. of times, but what was that system? For those who aren't familiar, it uh, existed in the 40s through 70s, as I as I mentioned, and they were residential institutions where girls would go generally because their families or priests had sent them there when they were unmarried and pregnant, and they would wait out their pregnancies there, give birth, and usually stay for some period of time to work off their accommodation in labor, and then they would go home. 
and they were in cities all across Canada, every major city, um, and in the US, the UK, Australia, New Zealand, they were all over the place. And the, the conditions and the treatment that the girls uh, experienced there, based on my research anyway, it was anywhere on the spectrum from uh, not great to horrendously abusive. And um, that's why it was, yeah, some of the most difficult research I've ever had to do. But it also um, really made me feel quite passionately about writing this novel and, and doing, doing it justice. Um, I had never heard about the maternity home system. Mm -hmm. And in the book, you mentioned, uh, I think the number was 300,000 uh, women right. were impacted by this. How, how mm -hmm. widespread was this in Canada? Uh, fairly. Again, it was um, in, in every major city and even some, some smaller towns, which is a little bit surprising given the fact that, you know, there was so much emphasis on secrecy and anonymity at these homes. But they were everywhere. Uh, there's an organization called Origins Canada, and um, I could talk about them for quite a while, but they, uh, they were established to help try to reunite um, these women with their children in later years. And um, they have a list on their website of all the addresses where they were, even just in the city of Toronto. So you can look it up and see where they used to exist. And I was shocked at how many there were actually, but they were just, they were in neighborhoods. Um, these girls were just squirreled away in secrecy, but they were, they were still in, in the city. In your author's note, you uh, write that a Senate committee studied the post-war maternity homes. What was found? Yes. So in, I believe it was late 2017, um, they struck a committee and had some hearings where they heard from the women who were sent to them as, as young women and girls and also their children. And they were essentially victim impact statements. And they did find, they released a report in 2018 with their findings. And they acknowledged that the government of Canada had a large role to play in separating these women from their children. And in that, they also made several recommendations for what the government could do uh, for reparations, essentially. And among those was a recommendation that the government issue a formal apology and acknowledgement to these 300,000 plus women that were impacted and traumatized by this system. They gave the government one year to respond. That was in 2018. So we're coming up on four years from then and the government has taken no action yet. Um, another historical event that you do talk about in the book is the abortion caravan. What was the abortion mm -hmm. caravan and what role did it play in making abortion legal in Canada? It was quite fascinating. So the abortion caravan was, took place in 1970 um, and it began in Vancouver and it was feminists who believed in abortion access and reproductive choice and they, uh, they took their protest on the road. So they came across from Vancouver, across Canada to Ottawa, and they arrived in Ottawa, I believe on Mother's Day weekend in 1970. And they had a massive protest on the lawn at Parliament Hill. And um, a couple of days later, they actually got into the House of Commons and they chained themselves to the railings in the chamber uh, to disrupt the proceedings. And I believe it was the first time in history that the chamber had been shut down due to a protest. And that was all to raise awareness and try to, um, to make a difference and shed some light on the issue of abortion access in Canada. Well, um, speaking of access, uh, accessing an abortion in Canada depends in part where you live. Uh, it's harder to access if you live in rural areas. There is a lack of clinics and their stigma still exists and abortion providers and women who are seeking them face harassment. Some provinces have even had to implement safe zones around clinics to keep uh, women safe and the people who work there safe. Um, having done the research uh, for your book and knowing the history it took to get here, are you surprised that access is still not available to all it's shocking it's, it's 2022 and um you know it was decriminalized in 1988 and uh I, I just can't believe that this is still an issue watching what's happening in the united states um whether debate around roe v wade uh has been reopened the case that mm -hmm. established um nearly 50 years ago that it was a constitutional right to have an abortion do you worry about that having a ripple effect here in canada i do i mean not to be alarmist but i'm i'm of the view that 
rights that are so hard won uh, need to be defended with constant vigilance. And, you know, I think we like to separate ourselves from our American neighbors in some ways. And we like to think that we're, you know, uh, more progressive in some ways, but that's not always the case. And I think um, we, we take it for granted at our peril. It's um, something that does need to be defended. And, you know, in this book, I've explored and tried to give a voice to um, the many women who made these incredible sacrifices, took outrageous risks, um, just ordinary women to secure these rights for us and future generations of Canadians. And I think, quite frankly, we, we owe it to them to defend it. So I would I would caution people to get uh, entirely complacent and you know uh, keep an eye out. When it comes to pro life versus pro choice, obviously not all women are on the same side of the issue. Does your book try to reach across that divide? A little bit, yeah. I mean, it's um, you know I think there, there's such a range of opinion on abortion from you know. Um, pro-choice to anti-choice and again sort of everywhere in between and I think it's often sort of separated into that kind of binary where you're either for or against and I think a lot of people have very mixed views of abortion for various reasons and you know my hope with this book and, and the depictions in the book is that people can perhaps you know regardless of what side you you land on or somewhere in the middle that you can maybe just, um, you know, try to have a bit of compassion for other people's choices, even if they're choices that you yourself would not make in the same situation. When you uh, you mentioned that you have uh, an infant, uh, congratulations yeah. and uh, oh, thank you. R.I.P. You'll <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, uh, You were pregnant um, with your first child during the writing of this book. Did it change your perspective on abortion? So I actually wrote the book before I became pregnant, but I was pregnant during the editing process um, where we were still doing a lot of revision. And it absolutely did. I talk about this a bit in the author's note, um, kind of sharing a bit of a, a personal story there that I thought was was appropriate in this case. But I, um, I was a bit shocked during my pregnancy about how much I felt like I was no longer in control of my own body. And I found it a bit unnerving in some ways, even though I was so happy to be pregnant. Um, and so it really opened my eyes to how it would feel to be pregnant uh, against your will and not have legal control to end the pregnancy if you wanted to. So it, um, you know, I'd always been a passionate defender of a woman's right to choose, but I don't think I had quite the same level of empathy uh, as I did after I'd experienced my own pregnancy. Um, finally, it is International Women's Day today. What does this day mean to you? Yeah, I mean, you know, we, we talk about feminism and obviously this is a, this is a feminist book and I, I touched on this a little bit before, but I think my, my feminism and what I celebrate on International Women's Day is um, women's right to choose, not just reproductively, but their their entire lives, their career, their relationships, um, you know, uh, decisions big and small. I think that's the celebration. That's what feminism does for us. I don't subscribe to the idea that there's sort of this, you know, feminist rule book. And if you have uh, decisions or opinions that are outside of that rule book, that makes you a bad feminist. Um, I think it is really an individual thing. But on International Women's Day, um, I think the same holds true, you know, it, it represents different things to different people based on their individual life experiences and what they want to celebrate um, in terms of, of womanhood. And Heather, uh, I cannot believe that this is your first television interview because you were terrific. Uh, congratulations oh, <laughs> on the book. Uh, again, there's a, an incredible twist that is just... <laughs> Amazing. I did a little dance around my living room. Uh, but congratulations on the book. And thank you so much for spending some time with us today. We appreciate it. Thank you so much, Nam. I appreciate it. Did the COVID-19 vaccine affect your menstrual cycle? It's a question many women asked each other quietly after they got vaccinated. It came up often enough that researchers took up the question. And what did they find? 
Let's ask from London, UK, Victoria Mayle, who teaches reproductive immunology in the Department of Metabolism, Digestion and Reproduction at Imperial College London. Welcome. Hello. Thanks so much for being on the show. Um, this is something that I think a lot of women have been talking about, and it's great to finally have some uh, answers to these questions. So the National Institutes of Health, NIH, uh, funded institutions to research possible links between COVID-19 vaccines and changes in menstrual cycles. What did they find? So this was a really big and well-designed study that used data that was collected by an app called Natural Cycles that people are entering in real time to try and keep a track of their fertility. And it looked at data from 2,400 people who were vaccinated and compared that to data from almost 1,500 people who were not vaccinated and acted as a control group. And the study found that after the first dose of the COVID vaccine, there was no difference in the timing of the next period. But after the second dose, there was on average a little bit less than half a day's delay. But the people who saw the biggest change were people who had both doses in the same cycle. And they actually saw more than two days delay to their next period. But importantly, even these people who had uh, more than a two day delay to their period, their periods were back to normal within two cycles. Um, were there, um, do the changes only apply to people who received their dose during their cycle? Um, well, everyone's always somewhere in their menstrual cycle, but no, it wasn't just people who had their vaccine during their actual period, the time during their bleeding. So it was really people, for example, if you had your period and then you managed to have both doses before the next period, these are the people who are most affected. And did it matter which vaccine you were getting? In this study, they only looked at Pfizer compared to Moderna. There weren't enough people who got uh, Janssen to talk about that. But with Pfizer versus Moderna, it made no difference which vaccine you got. Um, you know, um, I think for most women, um, depending on uh, what's happening around you, if you're stressed, we've been in a pandemic for uh, going on three years now. There's so many things that can happen that can change your cycle. Um, should people be concerned about the disruption in their cycle or the bleeding pattern? I would say no. One of the things that this study also did was it looked specifically to see what percentage of people saw a change in their cycle of more than eight days, which is the point at which we would start to say, oh, that's clinically significant. And although the average was way less than being clinically significant, a small percentage of people did see a change that was significant. Um, but that was actually um, only a little bit more than those people who might have seen a change in the unvaccinated group. And I think this underlines for us just how much periods can vary naturally. As you say, they can vary because of stress, weight gain, weight loss, all sorts of things. And so these vaccine mediated changes, they're quite small compared to the changes that we normally see. And nothing that I personally would worry about or that would stop me getting my vaccine. Indeed, uh, I have had all three doses of my vaccine. Uh, the changes that, that, that did occur, are they temporary? Yes, that's right. The study specifically looked to find out if people had um, gone back to normal. And in this study, they found that people had gone back to normal. Even those who had a delay of more than two days had gone back to normal within two cycles. Well, there's been a lot of uh, conversations online about, um, you know, people feeling a bit uh, worried about taking a vaccine because of the impacts to fertility. So I wanted to talk to switch our, our conversation to that. Um, is there an impact on fertility? This study didn't look at that, but actually we already have a lot of evidence around the vaccines and fertility. So even in the clinical trials, the participants were asked not to become pregnant, but they were big trials and accidents happen. And so there were across the four vaccines that we've approved in the UK, 65 accidental pregnancies. And those happened equally in the vaccinated and in the unvaccinated groups, which tell us that the vaccines aren't stopping people getting pregnant in a trial setting. Now that the vaccines have been more widely rolled out, we also have real-world data. 
So we have five studies from IVF settings, which show that if you're going for IVF, it makes no difference at all to the chance that the IVF will succeed, whether you're vaccinated or unvaccinated. And we also now have a really lovely study that followed more than 2,000 couples who were trying to conceive between December 2020 and September 2021. And this study also found that there was no difference in the chance of conception if the couples were vaccinated compared to if they weren't. That's interesting because I think there's still, um, I, I guess, you know, uh, you said that the changes occurred, uh, it was the periods were maybe like two days later. If you are trying to get pregnant, um, I found this out the hard way, there's only a few days in a month that you can get pregnant. So is that something that people should keep in mind or is that is that valid and does that make it valid for people to be concerned? Well, this study didn't look specifically at whether in the actual month that you get vaccinated, it's less likely that you'll get pregnant. What I will say from my own research is that um, I see an awful lot of people getting pregnant the same month that they get vaccinated. So it doesn't seem to be stopping people getting pregnant even in the same month. But if it is a concern to you that you might miss your fertile window, um, the advice if you're being vaccinated is the same as the advice to everyone else, you know, have sex, have fun and have it often. And that is the best way to hit that window. Well, what about men? Uh, do we know if a COVID infection impacts sperm count or the quality of the sperm? Yes, we do, actually. So there's um, really mounting evidence that suggests that um, if you get COVID as a male, uh, you'll see a reduction in sperm count and sperm quality, which lasts for about a couple of months. And this has been backed up by that same study of 2,000 couples who were trying to conceive that I mentioned, because this also looked at the effect of COVID. And in this study, if um, the female partner got COVID, it actually made no, no difference to the chance that the couple would become pregnant. But if the male partner caught COVID, then the couple were less likely to conceive for 60 days after he caught COVID. Um, what are some uh, common myths circulating around fertility and vaccines? Well, I think one of the reasons that people were concerned about this was because it was one of the very early pieces of misinformation that came out in December of 2020. And um, it was put about that the vaccine would um, was similar enough to a protein on the placenta that the immune response, the antibodies that your body makes to protect you against COVID when we give you a vaccine, could attack the placenta and cause a reduction in fertility. Um, but all the evidence that we have that I've spoken to you about just now obviously tells us that that's not actually happening because it doesn't make a difference to fertility. Another one that people sometimes worry about is that there was um, a slight misinterpretation of a document that was submitted to the Japanese regulator by Pfizer, which looked at rats and mice. And um, people have interpreted that to mean that there's vaccine that gets to the ovaries. Actually, that's not really the case. But again, the fact that people are getting pregnant um, just as normal after the vaccine, and also some studies that have been done, particularly in IVF settings, looking at ovarian health and ovarian function after vaccination, tell us that in people, getting vaccinated doesn't do anything to your ovaries. You know, um, I think once, once uh, a myth is out there or misinformation is out there, uh, it can be hard for people to feel comfortable, um, especially if you are trying to uh, get uh, pregnant. How would you suggest that public health combats the misinformation that's already out there around fertility and vaccines? Yeah, this is a really tough question, actually, because I spend a lot of my time thinking about how we talk to those who are already pregnant about getting vaccinated, because that's really recommended, because we know that COVID can be dangerous in pregnancy and COVID vaccination can protect you against it. And for that group, you know, they're already seeing doctors and midwives. So we have that trusted medical professional who's having regular contact with them. For people worried about fertility, it's a lot harder. There's no you know, regular contact with healthcare because these people are just getting on with their lives. And this is why I think that we have to take this kind of discussion to social media, uh, which is what I spend a lot of my time doing, and also to broadcast media like this. And I hope that you, know, you and me having this chat today will maybe set some people's minds who've been worrying about this at rest.
Um, I'd like to read a quote from your editorial, which was published on British Medical Journal. Uh, you wrote, uh, one important lesson is that the effects of medical interventions on menstruation should not be an afterthought in future research. Clinical trials provide the ideal setting in which to differentiate between menstrual changes caused by interventions from those that occur anyway, but participants are unlikely to report changes to periods unless specifically asked. Uh, what did you mean by that? Well, simply that we could, in the clinical trials, have said, you know, to that subset of the trial participants who have periods, um, why don't you tell us if you notice something different about your period? And the reason that that would have been such a powerful approach is because we had an unvaccinated control group who didn't know if they've been vaccinated or not. And so we almost certainly might have had something, and a Norwegian study has found something like this, where, you know, up to 40% of people in a normal cycle will notice something that's a little bit different from the usual. And that's obviously not to do with the vaccine because they've not been vaccinated. In clinical trials, we could have said, oh, okay, 40% of people notice something if they're in the unvaccinated group, and maybe 42% of people notice something in the vaccinated group. That's a small change, but because we've got a really good control group, it's a real change. If we had asked in the trials, we would have known that more than a year ago. But because it wasn't asked as a question in the trials, and because most people don't volunteer information about their periods unless you specifically ask them for it, we basically spent the last year playing catch up. And I just hope that in future clinical trials, this additional bit of information will be solicited so we don't end up in a situation again where we're playing catch up to find out if there's an effect of whatever the intervention is on the menstrual cycle. You know, I think there's a lot of frustration from women um, because it seems as if that was an afterthought. You know, um, I think when we're told to get our vaccines, we get our vaccines, and then all of a sudden we notice something change to our bodies um, that we weren't advised would happen. Do you uh, think that moving forward, it might be helpful for people who haven't been vaccinated or are considering getting vaccinated to say, your period might change if you do get the vaccine. I think that there's now enough evidence from this US study that we've discussed in detail and also the Norwegian one, which I've kind of touched upon a bit, to tell people when they're getting vaccinated, you might see a change to your period. It will be small compared to the kind of variation you might see normally. So you are likely actually to not notice anything at all, but you might notice something. If you do, it's short-lived. And the reason that I think it's important to say this is because I speak to a lot of people who have noticed, you know, big or long lasting changes that have happened after they've had the vaccine. The evidence suggests that these are not vaccine mediated changes. And what we would hate is for people to assume that a big or long lasting change that they saw was just a vaccine side effect when really they should be going to the doctor and getting that checked out because it's likely to be something else. So yeah, I think that we now have enough evidence to say it's a small change, it will go back to normal. If you notice a big change or one that doesn't go back to normal, you really need to get that checked out. It's not that likely to be a side effect of the vaccine. In our last 30 seconds, you know, some researchers uh, have argued that there's a lack of understanding on how males and females react to vaccines differently. Uh, what's your take on that? I don't think that's actually true. The trials, particularly for these vaccines, were really, really careful to make sure that there was a good balance between the sexes. And actually, um, uh, the trials also made sure that there was a really good balance of ethnic groups that represented, in particular, the American population. And the trials did look separately at how people responded to the vaccine, depending on all these kinds of important demographic factors and how well they were protected. So I wouldn't necessarily say that that's really the case, but I do definitely think that we should consider sex a bit more in the future in medical research. Dr. Mayall, thank you so much for spending some time with us and helping us understand these complex uh, topics. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. New research on prehistoric humans is bringing modern scrutiny to the lives of some of our most distant ancestors. It's also revealing that much of what we thought we knew, particularly about women, may have had more to do with 19th century perspectives than the archaeological record. April Noel is a Paleolithic archaeologist at the University of Victoria, and she joins us now from Victoria, British Columbia, for more. 
Great to have you on our program. Professor, how are you doing today? I'm fine, thank you so much for, uh, thank you so much for having me. Not at all, it's a pleasure. Where did the notion, let's start from scratch here, where did the notion that perhaps our understanding of the way things were in prehistoric times might actually not be accurate and we really need to rethink that whole thing? Well, I think there's a number of different reasons. So first of all, a lot of the um, early models for human evolution were developed in the 1800s and they were based on work that um, people were doing that early ethnographers were doing when they uh, in, were going around the world and encountering different uh, hunter-gatherer groups and so on. A lot of that work was done by men and in those situations, the the men who were doing this research had access to men in these hunter-gatherer communities. Often they weren't privy to the kinds of roles and secret knowledge and things like that that women were engaging in. Uh, and so, you know, by default almost, the, the ethnographies that they wrote, the reports that they wrote, really focused on, on the male perspective, male roles. And so then, when archaeologists were trying to make models for early human evolution and they were drawing from these early ethnographies for better or worse right that's also a bit problematic to do that directly but but they were using that information to make their their models of human evolution and so by default they were emphasizing the the male roles um so that's one reason and i think the the second reason is that uh you know, scientists are humans, right? They're they're a, a you know product of their culture. So what they see around them, you know, they write about what they know and they ask questions based on what they know. And so in the 1800s, it seemed very normal that um, women stayed stayed home and they um, took care of children, and that was their primary role. And so they tended to project that back into the past as well because it just made sense. It's it's what they knew about the world. And um, we call that presentism, you know, when you mm -hmm. kind of project what you know onto the past. And we still do that, but um, but certainly that was one of the one of the factors I would say for for why um, there there has been this real bias towards um, imagining our ancestral landscapes uh, being dominated by males and adult males in particular. In which case, how do you take the same ancient relics, the same ancient objects, fossils, etc., and how do researchers go about actually coming to different conclusions by looking at the same things? Well, that, yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I think it's because we're changing we're changing the narrative a little bit. We're asking different kinds of questions. So in the 1970s, there was really um, a bit of a sea change in archeology. span So not just in my field, but archeology span more broadly, where there was a rise of um, the archeology span of gender and feminist approaches to archeology, span uh, which really started to switch, you know, change up the conversation and to say, okay, well, there's, 50% of the population out there that we're consistently ignoring in our in our reconstruction. So what are women doing, you know? And one of my colleagues, Meg Conkey from, from uh, the University of California at Berkeley said, but it had to be more than just add women and stir, right? Like you can't <laughs> just suddenly throw them in and, and ask the same kinds of questions. We have to think about this in a more nuanced way. And that's really what um, we've been doing since the, the 1970s. 70s is really broadening this conversation to look at, um, to kind of look at different kinds of questions that we can ask. And so, um, and it's part of this sort of diversifying voices. So we're looking at, at what different sexes are doing. We're looking at different constructs of ge gender, for instance, and not, and again, not kind of um, projecting just this binary of uh, male femaleness onto the past, but to say, how did, how does, how did they construct gender? How does that relate to um, biological sex and so on? And looking at people of different ages, different ethnicities, and that kind of thing um, to get a more, sophisticated and richer understanding of the past. So that's one of the main things is that we've really changed the conversation. And I think that's really important. And then 
along with that and what you'll see or what your viewers will see in the in the documentary that follows is that we've also got some new techniques for looking at these old bones uh, so in other words, um, usually when we're sexing a skeleton, when we're trying to assign sex to a skeleton, we look at the overall skeleton, we look at the overall shape of different parts of the body, um, and the pelvis is the most important. And as your viewers will see, uh, that was sort of a reanalysis of the pelvis is what, what, what really changed um, the uh, diagnosis of one of the skeletons they talk about right at the beginning. Um, but well, beyond- me, let, let me jump in there because uh, mm -hmm. I want to give people a sneak preview of what we've got showing up later tonight. Oh, okay. Lady oh, Sapiens great. is the name of the documentary. It's coming on right after this program. Sheldon, a sneak preview if you would. In fact, one of the skeletons found at this 27,000 year old site was a woman. We have to think back to a society in the 19th century when women were not highly regarded. The women were at home and men played all the important economic and social roles. So naturally it was assumed that roles were similar in the Paleolithic era, that it was solely the male hunter who advanced society. The female was simply forgotten. We did not talk about her. And if she was mentioned, she was simply the homebody who took care of the children. And of course, the documentary goes on to say that is a misinterpretation, and we now can uh, definitely reinterpret much of what our understanding was in the past. Uh, my yeah. question, though, emerging from that is, how, how reliable do you think any new interpretation of the past, even with our scientific advances today, how reliable can it be? Um, well, I think, you know, there are two things. So definitely our techniques are getting better and better for being able to uh, sex these skeletons, for being able to age them and so on. We're finding new discoveries that really help us to, to understand the data uh, or to, to broaden our understanding of the past and so on. Um, but of course, we're always going to be impacted by by the culture in which we're, we're living, right? So we're always going to be influenced uh, in that way in terms of the kinds of questions that we ask. Um, but I, I do think that we, we do know so much more about uh, our early human evolution than we ever did before. Um, being able to um, do to extract DNA from these fossils, for instance, is opening a whole new world in terms of, of not only aging and so on, but uh, knowing more about uh, whether how related different people were, whether people married outside their local communities, uh, you know, just all in the kinds of diseases they had and what they look like. I mean, it's changing our understanding of skin color, eye color, all sorts of things like that about our, our past. So I'm actually quite um, optimistic about how much we can know and about all the incredibly exciting questions that come out of these new uh, technologies. Good to know. Let's, uh, again, I'm going to ask our director, Sheldon Osman, to bring up a photo here, and I'll have you comment on this. This is Venus. The Venus figurine, uh, one of the earliest known depictions of a human being. Now start by telling us how has this been evaluated in the past? Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> this is how long do you have? <laughs> this is one of my favorite, <laughs> uh, one of my love-hate kinds of artifacts. This is the Holofell figurine uh, from Germany, and it's about 35,000 years old, and it's made of mammoth ivory. Um, and uh, first of all, I, I try to not use the term Venus. Uh, Venus figurine is something that's in, in pop culture, uh, but it has uh, a lot of, uh, it has a, an, a sort of a, a racist history and so on to why it's used. So I use, tend to use the word figurine uh, for them. But uh, when this one was first published, it was really interesting. Um, it was uh, present, so it was published in the journal Nature, which is the most prestigious journal in the world for science. So along, along with the journal science, they're the top two. And when it was published, they had a website that went along with it and they referred to it. And this is this is nature, referred to it as a prehistoric pinup and a 35,000 year old sex object, hmm. right? And so this is, um, 
shocking to me <laughs> that this would happen. And, um, and then, of course, this went into the media, and we had The Economist describing it as smut carved from, a, from mammoth ivory and The Sun calling it the first page three girl and all kinds of terrible things, you know. And, and I was just really perplexed by this. And my colleague and I, uh, Melanie, Dr. Melanie Chang, and I wrote a, a paper about how, you know, in modern times, I mean, this is only a few years ago, we could describe it that way. And so, and I realized that people were really focusing on the breasts and other sort of second, what we call secondary sexual characteristics, instead of really looking at this as a, as a, in a more nuanced way. So this figurine actually has lines on it that could be body tattooing. And, you know, as, as, uh, Professor Nick Connard in your in the film you're going to show talks about it. Like there's no way that this is an accurate representation of the female body. It's either emphasizing fertility or is emphasizing uh, any number of things. If we look at um, animal figurines from the same period in the same region, they're also quite blocky. They've also got these engraved lines on them, and nobody calls them pornographic, right? So um, I think it's really interesting that even in this day and age, we're still projecting back on our, our thoughts onto or our present values onto these objects. So we see breasts and we think, oh, that must mean pornography, right? Well, and it gets course, worse. Uh, shall, you know, I, shall, yeah. I, shall I show examples of them? I mean, this is obviously uh, uh, male interpretations overly sexualized of, of what this is supposed to be. And of course, it gets worse in Hollywood, as we'll also show in the documentary later tonight. Sheldon, next clip, please. In the era of early silent films, the prehistoric woman found herself portrayed as a simple trophy to be hunted and prized by males with primal needs. Later, in post-war Hollywood films, the prehistoric woman resembled the fantasy woman of the era with long, luscious hair, shapely legs, amble breasts, and decked out in a tiny, tiny bikini. It says a lot about the fantasy that men have about women. These are fantasies that have endured for a long time. Two roles of a woman, the seductress on one side and the protective mother on the other. Um, okay, full confession. Uh, I like looking at Raquel Welch as much as the next guy, but, um, but how, I mean, you've got a tough job, I presume, to try to change a narrative that has been in place for hundreds of years, maybe more, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And um, it, it's, it's true. And, and when we published that paper, and I later did a, a TEDx talk on, on that same figurine, the reactions to it were quite, um, you know, lots of people loved it. And they're like, yeah, this is the kind of study that we needed to have done. And, and others were like, oh, you're, you know, you're, you're protesting too much. Clearly, you know, cave, cavemen, you know, were, were interested in, in, you know, the female form and so on. And I think that, that really isn't the point. I think the, the point is that, as, as it said in, in that clip, we tend to really regular, you know, we tend to, to, say that women only had one of two roles. And I think that actually the archeology span is really starting to show, um, and it shouldn't be surprising to us, but maybe it is. It's, a, it's really beginning to show that there are so many different ways in which women were able to uh, contribute to their communities. And so uh, one of the people they interview in the film is James Adabasio and I, I really liked his, his interview. I thought it was one of the most important ones there because he said so much of what we look at in the archeological record or so much what we think about the archeological record is determined by, in our field anyways, the stones and bones that we find. So the, the bones of large game animals and the stone tools because that's what preserves really well. And he made the point that in fact, you know, the vast majority of artifacts in hunter-gatherer societies are made of perishable materials and to a large extent we don't um we're not 
recovering those, accepting these fortuitous, uh, you know, occasions or situations. And but actually, his work with Olga Sofer, who you, they also mention in the film, um, has actually shown that there's an incredible textile um, industry dating back 25,000 years ago. We have strands of of spun spun dyed flax, for instance, we have imprints of textiles uh, that show that there were nets, there were bags, there were, um, there's, you know, fine clothing, we have these beautiful mammoth bone needles, those are kinds of, you know, technologies that women are often engaged in, uh, from what we can see around the world. Uh, well, also... let me jump in on that if I can, because I, I know the documentary yeah. uh, posits the idea that some of the work would have been so fine, some of the beading, for example, mm. that, that sort of fatter male fingers just simply couldn't have done it. So obviously, <laughs> women did, right? Yeah, I mean, it's it's quite possible. Again, if we're looking sort of ethnographically, uh, we do have a lot of examples of women making this kind of work, but I wouldn't say exclusively. So I'm a little hesitant to say that women only made, made these beads. Um, I tend to worry that we may go to the opposite extreme in some of our interpretations to say mm. women did everything. Um, but I would say definitely that we can't exclude them by any means. And I would also, because I'm someone who studies the archaeology of children, I would also say say that it's possible that children did some of this work too because children in many different societies um, uh, are known to to do some of the, the fine work that requires tiny hands as well. Gotcha. Is there any evidence uh, that you or your colleagues have come across that suggests that women had some modicum of control over their reproductive lives all those years ago? Uh well, you know, it's it's uh, interesting. So I wouldn't be surprised if they if they had an understanding of the relationship between uh, sex, for instance, and and pregnancy. I mean, I think they would make that connection, and they would probably also, you know, see it in the natural world. We usually think that doesn't happen until there's um, agriculture and domestication of animals, but I would imagine that it would come a bit earlier than that. And certainly there are ways to delay um, fertility, for instance, by extending breastfeeding or things like that. So there, there may have been some mechanisms in place if we can use analogies from uh, looking at people uh, around in traditional societies around the world. Hmm. And again, there may be an assumption that all of the cave paintings that have been found were probably done by men, but is there evidence to suggest that women contributed to uh, documenting their lives in cave paintings? Absolutely. Uh, so yeah, again, uh, those are one. This is one of those sea changes in our understandings. But people have done a lot of work looking at uh, handprints, in particular, that we find in these in these caves, and we know that some of them belong to women. We actually have men and women and children and adults as well. So we know that all different kinds of people were visiting the cave, that they were participating in the production of art. So again, I wouldn't say that women were doing all of the art because again, we don't know who is actually making the animal drawings at all, but we have to be able to, but now we know that that definitely women were there, that they were producing those, some of those handprints and there's absolutely no reason to think that they weren't doing you know some or more all of, of the art as well. How exciting is it for you? I mean, this is your living. This is of interest to, to those people watching this right now, but this is how you make your living. How exciting is it to you that tens of thousands of years after the fact, we can, we can experience profoundly new understandings of how the world used to work? I think I have the best job in the world, frankly. <laughs> I feel like, um, yeah, I get to ask the big questions about what makes us human and, and those kinds of things. And just uh, every single day, uh, almost, there's some brand new discovery that makes me think, oh my God, I have to go back and change uh, something. I just wrote a, a book on, on uh, Paleolithic children called Growing Up in the Ice Age. And the minute um, I sent in the final proofs and we were done uh, all these different discoveries came out of the you know one of the the oldest homo sapien uh, burials was a child and all this so that i keep throwing all these new discoveries in a file that i jokingly call second edition right because everything is changing so quickly and so i think i'm in a i'm 
I've got this amazing job at this amazing time where, where the, our technology is just opening up so much for us. And so over the next few years, really, um, things that I thought were absolutely impossible to know, I think are now opening up to us. So we now know women back then did far more than simply have the children and raise the children. They hunted, they foraged. What other things did they do that sort of put a lie to our understanding of the narrative of the way things have been? Well, I think again that that textile industry. I think probably women were also involved uh, in ceramics. So, um, and I would also like to to kind of emphasize that when we say you know they did more than raise children, I would say that actually that is a, a hugely important part of what they were what they were doing, in the sense that um, we talk about a maternal instinct as if. You just handed someone a baby and they would know what to do <laughs> with, with it. And we actually know that there's so much more skill to that instinct, that there's so much more learning that has to, to happen uh, and that it's, it's this huge skill set. So I think we, I, at the same time as I don't want to uh, say that's all they were doing, I want to emphasize how important and complex uh, that caregiving was, uh, but then to say, yeah, they were doing all these other things. If we think that um, that they were largely responsible for the gathering and probably for a lot of the small game hunting, not to say they weren't doing any large game hunting, but a lot of the small game hunting, then we're talking about 60, 70 percent of their of the communities. Um, subsistence is being provided by women, and I think that's hugely important. And all without ever reading what to expect when you're expecting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> the Stone Age version of that. <laughs> exactly. Well, I, I, you know, after having watched the documentary, and I hope people will stick around and watch it tonight, I do wonder two and three and four hundred years from now how they mm -hmm. are going to come to even newer and more exciting interpretations of what you and your colleagues are doing right now. That's really going to be something. April Noel, it's so uh, wonderful of you to join us here on this International Women's Day. Professor of Anthropology, University of Victoria, thanks for joining us on the line from BC. Thank you so much for having me. It was a lot of fun. Good night. <laughs>that is the agenda for Tuesday, March the 8th, 2022. Tomorrow, who are the so-called Russian oligarchs? And does hitting them economically matter to Vladimir Putin and his war in Ukraine? We'll consider that. Now, just a reminder that you can stay tuned for the TVO original documentary, Lady Sapiens, coming right up after this program, or stream it in Canada on our website, our YouTube channel, or smart TV services, including Apple TV and Amazon Fire. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.